Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on reaction kinetics and this is topic 8 and this is for the CIE specification so this is the Cambridge Internationals topic uh, exam board should I say um, if you're studying CIE then this is perfect for you obviously this will go through the concepts of rates of reaction and looking at Maxwell Boltzmann graph etc so there's loads of different things in here so if you're studying CIE then this is the place you need to be um, please there's loads of videos on the um, Allery Chemistry YouTube channel dedicated to the CIE the full range of A-level videos on there as well please subscribe and show your support that would be fantastic and um, these slides as well are also available to purchase for your revision purposes they're great value for money and um, if you click on the link in the description box below you can get a hold of them there um, but they're ideal for obviously supplementing your revision your notes textbooks that you have etc but most importantly please hit the subscribe button that would be absolutely fantastic okay so without further ado let's have a look at topic eight reaction connect uh, reaction kinetics should i say can't speak this morning um so we're gonna look at um the first part of it is rate and collision theory and i keep saying this in every video but there is a lot of overlap with the cie topics they kind of interlink with e with each other so if you haven't seen the previous topic videos i recommend you do see them there is there's going to be some little bits and pieces in here which might require you to use information from previous topics the majority for this topic in particular is quite standalone anyway um, and obviously it builds up in year two if you're doing the full a level as well so let's look at rate and collision theory first it sounds fascinating doesn't it so um so basically for any reaction to occur particles have got to collide with each other that's quite obvious isn't it really i suppose they've got to, they've got to hit each other to actually for a reaction to happen but there's going to be other criteria as well for um for an actual a reaction because the molecules can bump into each other but it doesn't necessarily lead to an actual chemical reaction so rate of reaction as it probably you might have guessed is the um is how fast something goes so it's the official definition is the change of concentration or amount of a reactant or product per unit time and so we can actually come up with a proper equation and you've got to remember this um, which is rate equals the amount of reactant used or product made divided by time okay so this is obviously looking at the rate how fast a reaction can go and as i mentioned before particles move all the time and they collide into each other as well you know it's like a if you had to kind of I kind of imagine it like a box of particles it's a bit like a particle party i suppose so um so they're kind of moving around all the time but most collisions actually don't lead to reaction the vast majority of them will kind of bump into each other but there's no reaction there between them so collision theory is basically um well, it's a theory looking at the collision of particles. So the first point is for a reaction to occur, the particles must collide in the right direction. In other words, they've got to be orientated in the right way for them to actually react in the first place. So there's no point in them kind of reacting sideways on when that's not going to lead to any reaction because you've got functional groups, etc., which you'll see obviously later on in, in topic nine when you start to look at organic chemistry. So... Um, the other point as well is they must also have the minimum amount of kinetic energy. So these particles have got to be able to, um, you know, hit with the right amount of energy. If they kind of just kind of kiss each other, I suppose, they just kind of just brush off each other, then they're not really going to react. They're just going to kind of bounce off and kind of go their separate ways. So they've got to hit with enough energy. And the key word here is kinetic energy, okay, which is obviously movement energy okay so let's have a look at another point now you might have seen um some of this in um, topic seven um where it was briefly introduced there which was activation energy but in topic eight we talk about it a lot more extensively okay and it becomes more prominent and this is activation energy so activation energy um is the minimum amount of energy required for a reaction to occur okay so for a reaction to occur it has to have a certain amount of energy and that energy is called activation energy kind of makes sense because to activate means to kind of 
to to do something to initiate something so activation energy so we can use what we call an energy profile diagram and again you might have seen little bits of this in topic um in topic seven when we looked at um, enthalpy and um, enthalpy changes for example because it kind of ties in to an extent so you've got reactants here you see this diagram on the left here there it is Okay, so you've got reactants and you've got products and you've got this profile. Now, this is the, the energy profile that a reaction would take. Okay, so molecules, um, what happens is when you start and um, say if you heat them up or if they, have, if they gain some more energy from somewhere, molecules bond stretching um, as they have a lot more kinetic energy. So the bonds in between the atoms start stretching out because they've got a little bit more energy. Okay, at this point here. Um, then you've got this kind of hump. So you've got to put enough energy in just at the start to get this reaction to go in the first place. And the particles have got to absorb that energy and they've got to sustain that energy when they collide with another particle for them to react. And we call that the activation energy. Okay, So it's always between reactants and the top of the profile because they might ask you, they might give you a diagram and say, where's the activation energy? So it's always between reactants and the top of the profile, always. So at this point, right at the top here, the bonds have sufficient energy. Um, this point, obviously, the bonds have sufficient energy for them to break, so they have enough energy to do that. And that's what you need when you're um, obviously reacting. Um, you know, when you've got chemical reactions, you need to break bonds in reactants and form new ones in products. Again, that was seen in topic seven. So reactions that have a low activation energy need less energy to break the bonds because obviously they don't need as much energy to do that and vice versa so that's really really important okay normally we're referring to heat here for energy there are other forms but heat isn't obviously normally the common one here okay so we're going to look at something called the maxwell boltzmann distribution curve um sounds very exciting um there's a lot of these names you'll find in chemistry there's a lot of um scientists who um they like to name things after themselves they're, they're incredibly um proud of their work and and rightly so obviously it takes a lot of brain power to do this um people with bigger brains than me um and they name these things after them so you'll see a lot of these kind of theories and it's the same with physics as well to be honest um and to an extent biology a lot of scientists will kind of name things after themselves so here there was a collaboration as there normally is between um maxwell and boltzmann and basically they come up with this fancy new diagram well it's not new it's been around for a while but at the time it was so particles in a gas uh, so particles of gas in a sample they move at different speeds okay so some will move really slowly some will move really quickly and um, they have different amounts of kinetic energy so if i had like a box and imagine you could see a hundred gas particles in there they won't be moving with the same speed some will be moving quicker than others so if we plot this kind of distribution of their relative speeds, okay, on a graph, say if we kind of could monitor the speed of each particle and plot it on a graph, then we get something called a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And it'll look something like this. So um, and you, as soon as you see a graph like this, you've got to think Maxwell-Boltzmann. It's, like it's like a thing that should be ingrained in your mind. So on the left-hand side of the axis, you've got the number of molecules. So this is how many molecules are obviously in the in the box or whatever you're studying and this is the kinetic energy so this is the amount of energy that particular molecule will have okay so the graph there's key things you need to know here and the exam board again might ask you to draw a maxwell boltzmann distribution and get you to explain different features of the graph okay so it's really important that you're aware of this so the graph always starts at zero zero okay always right in the corner it never starts up here it never starts down here always in the corner there and that's because no particles have zero kinetic energy. All the particles in that box must have some form of energy. It might not be a lot, or it might be loads, but none will have zero energy. So the area under the curve, so this bit here, is equal to the total number of molecules in the box. So this represents, if we had 100 molecules in a box, for example, this represents 100 molecules. This bit right at the peak of a maxwell boltzmann distribution curve is the most likely energy of a particle in a sample so this is the mode for all those mathematicians out there so this is the most likely energy so if we sampled a hundred um a hundred samples of, of particles then let's say you might have 
um, I don't know, 15 of them might have exactly this amount of kinetic energy, okay? So it's the most likely energy value. This is very different to the mean energy value, okay? So the mean energy is going to be um, likely to be slightly to the right because actually you've got a, quite a few particles here and the mean is obviously another form of average, but it's always to the right of this peak here, okay? So don't get that confused. And down here, this will be the activation energy. Now, this could be, you know, anywhere. It doesn't really matter, but this is normally it's quite high up at the top end of the curve. And these particles, obviously, at the top end here, these have very little energy and they actually move quite slowly because obviously they've got low kinetic energy. Whereas most particles will move with a moderate speed. So that's kind of under the tallest bit of the graph. And some of them may even have enough energy to actually react now you can see the vast majority of the particles obviously will sit within this bit of the curve which means they don't have enough energy to actually react so they'll bump into each other but they won't react but these particles over here they have a high amount of energy and actually they have so much energy that they have enough for them to actually react and so anything to the right of the line which is the activation energy means these can actually react these particles can react okay so what affects this rate of reaction? So we're going to keep the same graph that we've got here before. So temperature affects the rate of reaction. No surprise. Um, so particles have, on average, more kinetic energy when they're heated. Okay, so if you provide some energy to them, obviously they're going to kind of wiggle around a little bit more. So a larger proportion of the molecules will have energy greater than the activation energy. And the red line here... Um, basically shows you the um, particles with the higher which have been heated basically so the red line is for heated particles now what you can notice here is there's a larger area under the curve beyond the activation energy the, what's really important though is the total area of both curves is the same we haven't introduced any more particles still got the same number of particles but on average more particles have energy greater than the activation energy so you get this kind of slight flattening of the curve the peak is slightly to the right of the original curve here and obviously you've got more particles with energy greater than the activation energy there there we are okay so make sure you do that if they ask you to draw a graph the, the curve is slightly to the right the peak is lower the area under the graph is the same and the area under the curve so the area under the curve is the same and the area under the curve beyond the activation energy increases just like that okay make sure you're able to draw these accurately you cannot you should only examiners are looking for this as well you should only have one place where it crosses the original line which is there it should never cross again down here because it's always going to be higher okay so just watch out for that these key points here easy marks really okay so if we look on the other side then let's say we cool this gas down um, and we have a smaller proportion of the molecules will have energy greater than the activation energy and obviously this is the the blue line um, and obviously we have a smaller area under that so some key features here just like with the with, when we're heating it is the curve actually now shifts to the left and you can see here to the original white curve so we have um, more particles with less energy as you can see on there so that's the most most particles less energy and um, obviously the mean is is slightly shifted across as well and um, the area under the curve is still the same that doesn't change the peak is higher and the area under the act beyond the activation energy is lower than what it was under the white line so these are really important concepts that you've got to be able to draw these graphs correctly okay okay so what else affects rate so when we get a faster rate of reaction uh, sorry, why do we get a faster rate of reaction when temperature is increased? Um, so you need to know a little bit about kind of collisions here. And we're going to look at it on obviously on a molecular and an atomic level here. So obviously the particles will move around at higher temperatures. They'll move, move around a little bit more than what they were doing before. Okay, so they're already moving. You just move more. So they collide more often, and hence that's why you get reactions that happen faster at a higher temperature. So you've got an increased likelihood of collisions okay 
So, and the combination of more collisions and more energetic collisions means that there's a small increase in temperature will lead to quite big increases in the rate of reaction. So, um, that's going to be quite, you know, quite an important point that you must be able to recall as well. So, it's about the increased chance of collisions and then collisions have more energy as well. And that's why you get a faster rate of reaction. Okay, let's have a look at some of the ones. Uh, concentration and pressure. There are also other factors which can affect the rate of reaction. So if we look at pressure first, so again, we're still referring to gases here, of course. So increasing the pressure will increase the rate of reaction as well. Um, and the particles effectively are, are closer together. You're squashing them and you're putting them into a space where there's less there's less kind of space for them to move around. So they're bound to bump into each other more often if you do that. So they will collide more often. There's more frequent collisions, and so therefore there's a higher chance of a reaction. So a lot of this is probability. Listen to the terminology that we're using here, the likelihood of and the chance of. Yeah, more often, more frequent. You've got to be using these words in your exam because this is exactly what they're looking for. Concentration. Um, so this would be obviously mainly with solutions. So it could be obviously um, a lot, lot of chemistry, to be honest, is solution based. So increasing the concentration will increase the rate of reaction. So particles are obviously much closer together and they collide a lot more often. So we've got something that's more concentrated. Therefore, you've got more frequent collisions and a higher chance of a reaction. OK, so you can see obviously the red dots here. There's more red dots. Let me just have a look here. There we are. So you've got more red dots in here. So you've got a much higher chance of these colliding than you have if it's under a low concentration, which it is over here. OK, so terminology is really important, obviously, there. So the other one which can affect red are catalysts. Now, catalyst, and you might have seen this again. You would have seen this in topic seven um, when we looked at... Um, um, Enthalpy changes, so it's kind of linked in that in that sense. So a catalyst is a substance that increases the rate of reaction, and it does this by providing an alternative pathway that has a lower activation energy. Okay, so remember we looked at activation energy before, it lowers it. And a catalyst is chemically unchanged at the end of a reaction. So a catalyst is never used up in a reaction. And later we're going to have a look at some homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysts. You've got two types of catalysts, um, but they must not be unchanged. They're unchanged, basically. You've got to remember this definition. Okay, really important. So you get a couple of marks for that, at least. So catalysts are generally used, as you probably might be aware, to speed up um, specific reactions and different catalysts are used for different reactions in total. So they're used to make a product faster. They can be used to lower the temperature required for a reaction. And obviously that's good for industry because you save money and you obviously save energy and you save time. So that's really important. So making the product faster, but also lowering the energy costs um, to do that. So this is an example of a catalyst. And um, this is um, a solid based catalyst and this it, this catalyst is called zeolite um, and it doesn't look kind of anything nice does it it looks like some kind of cheap mints or something like that but it's not it's basically these are uh, zeolites are um, tiny pellets with tiny micro pores within them and each one of them pores can hold a reaction uh, or can help to kind of catalyze a reaction so it's just an example of a um, of a catalyst Okay, so catalysts can be homogeneous or heterogeneous, as I mentioned before. Now, you will have seen homogeneous and heterogeneous um, previously in the pre in previous topics. Um, so just as a bit of a, um, a little bit of a reminder, heterogeneous, so hetero, um, so it means they're in a different phase from the reactants. So um, the catalyst is um, generally um, obviously different from, from the actual main reactant, reactant body. So, for example, Haber process, which you will have seen in topic seven, um, has gas phases, so nitrogen and hydrogen and ammonia, as you can see there. Um, but the catalyst used here is solid iron. Now, we'll see iron is a solid, which is a different phase to the reactants and products. So this is a heterogeneous catalyst. Now, if we increase the surface area of the catalyst, 
in the heterogeneous catalyst, then this will increase the rate of reaction. And this is because more particles can react with that catalyst at the same time. So generally, you would look at iron and maybe put it on a mesh. You'd turn it into a powder, place it onto a mesh to increase the surface area as much as you can, and then pass the reactants through this mesh, which can then help it to react um, in, under the Haber process to produce ammonia. Homogeneous catalysts, um, these obviously are in the same phase as the reactants um, and generally homogeneous catalysts are in aqueous solutions so normally you might have a um, an aqueous solution or aqueous solutions reacting together and you might add a liquid catalyst in there as well. So a classic example is using sulfuric acid to make an ester. So you can start with the carboxylic acid to make an ester and again you'll see this um, later on in the organic uh, chemistry topic uh, but you can use sulfuric acid which is obviously um, aqueous to um, help catalyze this reaction now what they do homogeneous catalysts work slightly differently in that they form an intermediate species by reactants combining with the catalyst which react to form the products and then the catalyst is reformed again so effectively the, the catalyst is kind of is reacting with the actual reactants in the first place but then it's reformed later on. Whereas with a heterogeneous catalyst, it's normally a solid base and um, substances attach themselves to the solid surface and then kind of desorb um, later on. But you'll see some diagrams um, kind of demonstrating this as well. Okay, so why do we use catalysts? So we've seen a few examples already, um, but it's just a kind of... Um, just to kind of talk through some specific examples. But catalysts are used in industry for quite a few reasons. So A, they lower the temperature needed for a reaction to proceed. Obviously, this means less money is spent and less carbon dioxide is produced because normally heat is produced through burning fossil fuels. So if you're not burning as many of them, then there's less carbon dioxide produced. Um, they speed up the reaction by providing an alternative pathway for a reaction to proceed. And we'll show you some diagrams in a moment. Um, and they change the properties of a product as well. So that can be used. Now, there's one particular example, which is what we call a, a Zyglenata catalyst. And it can turn polyethene or polyethene or polythene um, to a more dense, rigid and higher melting point plastic. So um, catalysts can obviously change the properties of materials, which is really useful, especially in this day and age when plastics are actually used in just about everything and anything. And if there's a way in which we can maybe reuse existing plastics and turn them into a different form by using catalysts, that's going to be incredibly powerful because it means we've got less waste as well. So chemistry has a big role to play in this, actually. So obviously, there's environmental benefits as well um, for using catalyst. As I mentioned before, lower temperatures and pressures. Obviously, the reaction conditions can be less severe. Um, obviously, reduces the amount of CO2 produced. Less waste is produced as well um, because catalysts allow us to um, be a little bit more efficient with the um, raw materials that we're using and try and convert as much of the atoms in the raw material into the product that we need so um and also a lot of reactions chemical reactions are multi-step processes so they're kind of stacked up um, in multiple different processes if a catalyst can remove two or three of them processes it means we're not wasting as much either so for those of you, just to kind of briefly, I suppose, for those of you who are studying um, the full A-level, um, you'll need to know a little bit about this, um, which is catalytic converters. And obviously they're found in cars, and they reduce pollution. Um, now they are made um, from a rhodium, platinum and palladium alloy. So they're pretty expensive. Um, they're not cheap if uh, any of you know... Um, you know the cost of these things you don't really get them replaced that often to be honest but they're incredibly valuable metals um, and effectively catalytic converters in cars um, basically you react carbon monoxide with nitrogen monoxide that exists in the fuel and it produces carbon dioxide and nitrogen which is not as toxic as the previous two it's still not great because obviously carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas but it's better than carbon monoxide which is poisonous so it tries to convert as much of that as it can so you can't let the converter in your car is the bit underneath i don't know if you, you probably might not be interested but if you if you jack up a car have a look underneath um it's, it's basically it's part of the main exhaust and you'll have this big kind of cylinder bit um probably 
midway under the car and that's where your catalytic converter will be so that'll be inside that box there so the gases will come out of the exhaust flow through this catalyst here and try to remove some of these harmful pollutants okay so um, let's have a look at some heterogeneous let's have a look at a heterogeneous catalyst and let's bring that Maxwell Boltzmann distribution graph back in again so um, here's the graph and remember the yellow line in the previous one was the activation energy now this is the activation energy with no catalyst so what a catalyst does is it lowers the activation energy so more particles now have enough energy to react so you can see on here that the yellow line is obviously the one with no catalyst and this is the one with catalyst so it just nudges that further down to the left we're not changing the actual body of the graph we're just changing the position of the activation energy so looking at it from an energy profile diagram so remember this is what we'd seen before so this is your activation energy with no catalyst and obviously with a catalyst the pathway is different so we have a lower activation energy and so therefore we can produce products with we don't need to put as much energy in in the first place to produce these products that we see there so um, this Maxwell Boltzmann obviously it applies to homogeneous catalysts too. There's no difference um, in terms of how a homogeneous catalyst works in that sense. Okay, so how can rate be measured in experiments? Um, so obviously this is going to be quite important because practically we've got to be able to measure rate. Um, electrical conductivity is one of them. You might, not many reactions do this to be honest, but during a reaction there might be a change in the number of ions that's produced and therefore we can measure the change of electrical conductivity. We can use a voltmeter to try and detect this um, and that obviously can, can change that. Um, if you've got a product that is producing a gas, then we can measure a mass loss. Very simple bit of equipment. You have a top pan balance with a conical flask. You've actions in there producing, bubbling away, producing a gas. This gas can escape out of the out of the actual vessel. Um, and then we can basically measure the mass difference between the two or monitor the rate at which this is um, which is this is leaving um, it's not massively accurate it's a one method and obviously this is no good if this is producing something like chlorine because obviously you don't want to breathe that in it's not very good for you well it's toxic so another way probably a, a better way of doing this is by using a, um, a gas syringe instead um, and basically it's a very similar setup so you have your reaction which is bubbling away with a sealed top with a delivery tube into a gas syringe and then what you can do is say every i don't know 10 seconds 30 seconds is monitor how much gas is produced over time depending on obviously how fast this reaction is going um but then you can record your results and then obviously plot your rate of reaction as well okay so um, once you've got your data, you can actually obviously work out rates from plotting a graph. Um, so here we've got an example of um, a, a reaction producing gas, um, and this is gas produced in centimeters cubed, and this is obviously time in minutes. Now, obviously, when you're looking at, for those of you who do physics or maths, you know, you'll obviously be familiar with this. This is stuff you do at GCSE anyway, so a lot of you should be familiar with this. But to find the gradient, the gradient basically is the rate of reaction. Um, and gradient is the change in y over the change in x so obviously y being the vertical and x being the horizontal which is along here and obviously the bigger the section of the graph this is a classic classic rule doesn't matter what subject you're doing if you're measuring the gradient of something try and get the biggest area of the graph um, then obviously that's going to be better and just to make your life a little bit easier try and find points on the graph where you can actually read them easily you don't want to go like halfway between a graph I know that might sound really obvious, but you get people who do that and it just makes it much more difficult. So keep it simple. Um, so yeah, so we've got an example here, as you can see, where we've drawn the gradient. And in this case, this is going to be six and along the top, it's going to be four. So we put our figures into the into the um, uh, uh, the formula here um, and then we get a gradient of 0 0.67. In this case, it's going to be centimeters cubed per minute. What you're looking for is the units that they're giving you in the graph. So make sure you look for the units and write them down as the units for the gradient. And the gradient is the rate of reaction. So this is how fast this reaction is going. Okay, so let's have a look at um, a different type of graph. So that was a straight line graph. So let's have a look for a curved graph. So here it is here. 
Um, similar principle, but again, you know, as you may be aware, if you want to try and find the gradient on a curve, you've got to draw a tangent. So a tangent is obviously a diagonal line that meets a curve at a specific point, and that point is obviously the point of interest that you wish to look at. So the very important thing is to extend that line right across the graph. That's the you know it's it's good practice to do that and work out the gradient as we've just mentioned before um, and obviously the gradient is the rate at that specific point on the curve so let's have a look so here we're going to work out the rate of reaction at three minutes so we put our there we are we put our tangent in at three minutes so it must sit parallel at the three minute mark so there's a three minute mark there so it must just just sit parallel at that point and then we extend that line straight out and that's our tangent and then we just follow the same process so the gradient try and get the biggest one that you can that gives you nice whole numbers so change in y for change in x so y is 0 0.8 x is 4 so there we are, there's your change. In this case, it's grams per minute because we're looking at the mass of a reaction vessel over time. So, not too bad. Um, a few graphs there. Um, make sure you understand Maxwell Boltzmann and you know what impact a catalyst has on that and temperature and pressure, etc. Um, like I say, all these slides are available um, for you to purchase if you wish to use them. They're great value for running, great for your revision. Click on the link below in the description box and you'll be able to get them there. I've kind of bundled them together with all the physical chemistry. So topic one to eight is kind of bundled together. But there is the full range of A-level stuff on there. And please subscribe to my YouTube channel as well, Alloy Chemistry. That'll be much appreciated just to show your support. Um, right, that's it then. Bye-bye.